everyone. Uh, we're very pleased uh, to have all of you here and uh, especially pleased to have uh, Marina Hara with us today who will talk to us about tiny trades, big questions uh, and fractional shares. Uh, and the paper is joined with Robert Bartlett and Justin McCrary. Um, Maureen has asked that you hold on to your questions until she makes uh, breaks and then you're welcome to raise your hand and uh, speak up and ask questions. Uh, if it's a clarification question, I'm sure you can ask uh, during the talk and also the chat is enabled. Please feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll uh, pick them up from there. Uh, Maureen, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much again. Well, thank you, Katya, and thank you very much for being invited to present this paper. Uh, as Katya mentioned, it's joint work with uh, Bobby and Justin, who are kind of the strangest law profs uh, that I know. Uh, you know, they remarkable um, data and econometric skills. So it's great fun to uh, to work with them. Um, let me get there. We go. Um, so the motivation for this paper is very straightforward. Um, Real-time fractional share trading is now offered by most uh, retail U.S. brokers. And uh, it, it's, it's been an interesting development. Many of you remember that there have always been fractional shares through things like dividend reinvestment programs, if you're involved in those. Um, but this is really very different. And um, it really gets started in around 2019, 2020, early days. Um, and it comes along roughly at the same time as the, um, you know, um, elimination of commissions for retail trades. So you, you sort of have this um, kind of interesting beginnings of something. And it also comes along with the new technology for trading, right? So for example, you can buy, you know, ten dollars worth of Berkshire A, which during the time we wrote a paper about Berkshire, it was a four hundred and fifty thousand dollars stock. So, at the time we did this little thing, it was at four hundred and seventy four thousand dollars. So your ten dollar order meant you bought point zero 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 zero, I think maybe another zero to one of a share. Um, so, you know, these seem like oddities in some ways, but um, the interesting question is, well, how important are they? And, you know, one of the things that makes answering that question is we don't know very much about this. Um, no exchange in the U.S. will execute a fractional share. So they're all executed off exchange. And the consolidated tape will not report a trade for less than one share. So... You know, we think these things are out there, but uh, and we can we can actually place the orders and do it, but it's very difficult to know what they are. So we've been internally referring to them as kind of the Yetis of the stock market. Um, getting this to work. Um, so that you know, we we think they're out there, but they're very hard to spot, and mostly people have looked for footprints, and uh, that's what we're going to do in this paper. We're going to be seeing if we can track these little yetis uh, using their footprints and see what we can come up with. Now, I think there's a variety of research questions here, and the first one is one that you know, as microstructure people, we're intrigued by: is how can we find evidence of fractional share trading within the consolidated tape? Right. So ideally, we would very much like to use the databases that we're comfortable with to see if we can find it. And what we're going to do in this paper is show you we think we can. Uh, and then if you could figure out something about these fractional shares, then the, the big questions. Right. And so these tiny trades, you know, what do we want to know about them? You know, why do investors trade in these things? Uh, does it represent a distinct form of retail order flow? If so, does it present information content? And then, you know, from a regulatory perspective, you know, how compatible is fractional share trading with our integer-based system of reporting? And one of the things that I didn't write here, but I want to stress for this audience, is that if you do want to do research on fractional shares, what are the pitfalls? And I want to stress those because 
unlike a lot of the areas that we work in, you know, once you kind of figure out how you're going to do it, it, you know, it's kind of straightforward. You make the adjustments that we make in different directions. But with these, you have to be very, very aware that um, there are issues here. And um, that's part of why we wrote the paper was to show you that, yes, there's some things you can learn, but be careful. And and uh, so I'm going to try and be careful and and not overclaim, but I think we've got some nice results, and at least I hope that'll be the case. So, first thing we want to do is we want to think about how we're going to find the footprints of fractional share trades. And I think to kind of appreciate the issue, it's kind of fun to start with a um, non-fractional off-exchange U.S. trade, right? So. There on the left, we have our basic retail Robinhood trader uh, who thinks that they want to buy one share of GameStop at market. Uh, so they're going to send an order to Robinhood. These are non-fractional now. These are just the normal everyday shares. They're going to send the order to Robinhood. And Robinhood sells their orders to Citadel, right? So... Basically, the way I think about it is Robinhood as a broker executes this on an agency basis and sends it to Citadel. So let's suppose that our NBO, um, our best offer is uh, 300 right now with 100 shares offered and 100 shares offered at 290. All right. Well, Citadel, being the kindly uh, firm that they are, gives you price improvement of a sense. Uh, remember, this is an example, so we're being a little cruel. So they're gonna give you a fill at 299.996, right? And I, I use this as a little example because later we're gonna talk about a way that people have tried to find retail trades using the execution prices as a way to signal that this was retail. And that's using these weird little numbers, right? As opposed to the round numbers. So my buddy Citadel here is gonna give you a little bit of price improvement. And then what are they gonna do? Well, this is an off exchange trade. So it has to be reported to a TRF and they're gonna report this to NASDAQ. And then NASDAQ is gonna report this to the SIP. And that's what a trade looks like for a non-fractional retail trade, okay? So let's move on and do the footprints of a fractional share trade, okay? So we have our same, you know, happy little retail trader. Now they wanna buy their 100 shares of GameStop, but rather now instead of buying one share of GameStop, they're gonna buy $100 worth of GameStop. And this is one of the things that I think is really intriguing out there right now. If you go to your Fidelity account or your Schwab account or your Interactive Broker account or your Robinhood account or any number of ways to enter orders now, you don't have to enter them in shares. You can enter them in dollars, right? So the change to dollars is one that I don't think we've paid enough attention to because I think it actually could make a lot of difference in a number of ways. But in this paper, we're really only looking at the impact that it has, say, for fractional shares. So because this is $100, by definition now, we're going to buy a fractional share. So the money gets sent to Robinhood, right, who gives them a fill of 0.339 shares at, 29, at 295. Now, you notice they gave them a midpoint fill. That's actually one of the things we found most intriguing when we started working on this paper. Because I'm going to show you later, Robinhood actually filled all these uh, these fractional shares at midpoints. So it's like kudos to Robinhood. Um, so anyway, you send in your $100 order for GameStop. You get a fill of 0.339. It executes at a principal basis. Why? Because the big uh, wholesalers like Citadel and those guys, they, won't, they don't buy fractional shares. So this is going to execute as a principal basis by Robinhood. Now, Robinhood starts trading fractional shares. We think it's really more like January, 2020. They say in 2019, they were, they were going to do it, but we can't find any evidence of that. But they didn't realize 
that it was required to report these trades to a TRF. So, oops. Um, so on their uh, 2021 10K, they kind of fess up. For example, when we, we launched our program, we didn't report. Uh, but since then, in, for, FINRA has informed us that we have to report. And what's going to be interesting is that actually you can do ex post reporting. And, and we're going to show you kind of how that works. It doesn't report to the consolidated tape, but it does report to FINRA data. So anyway, what does that mean? Well, how should fractional shares rep be reported in a reporting system that's based on integers? Okay, catch this. Okay. To answer that question, you must go to FINRA's trade reporting frequently asked questions. This is the advantage of having lawyers for co-authors. I was unaware there even was this page, but notice this, all right? All right. Must trades for less than one share be reported? Yes. As noted, where a trade is executed for say one third share, the firm should round up and report a share quantity of one. So here's the good news, they're gonna report. Here's the bad news, they're gonna report every fractional share, even if you bought 0.000021 of Berkshire A as one share to the consolidated tape. So this is kind of fun. Um, and so now when we begin to think for, you know, finding these footprints, this is what essentially happens, right? So. Now, Robinhood will report to a TRF, right? There's three TRFs in the United States. They report generally to NASDAQ. So they report to the NASDAQ TRF. And what do they report? One share at 295, okay? So needless to say, from an academic perspective, this is like, uh-oh, right? I mean, the good news is, okay, there is a trade report. The bad news is this is what was actually bought. So that's gonna be one of our first things that we're gonna to have to play with. And just to keep in perspective, the importance of this, all right? This model of how to execute trades is also used by DriveWealth, Fidelity Schwab, Interactive Brokers, Alpaca. Uh, you may not have heard of DriveWealth, but they're a backend system that many of these um, sort of FinTech trading programs like Cash App or Revolut, people like that, they, they all clear with drive wealth, right? Uh, Alpaca is a similar sort of firm. They've been coming out of nowhere and they're now doing a surprising amount of, of business. These guys all use this model. But here's caveat number two, all right? Not every firm does this. So not all fractional shares are actually going through this mechanism. There's a very large firm called Apex Trading that also does a lot of the back end, if you will, for a number of FinTech apps. And they don't do this. And as far as we've been able to establish, they don't, they don't report anywhere. And we go into detail in the paper on this. So first thing up front, we're gonna be able to show you what we think is a very interesting picture of the fractional share trading, but we're not actually seeing all the fractional shares. And one of the things we think that's really intriguing is because we're gonna show you that even with what we can look at, which includes uh, Robinhood and Drivewell, there are a lot of fractional share trading out there. So I wanna just stress this up front. Um, so using this model to execute fractional share trades has two implications. Each fractional share execution will appear in the tape as a non-exchange trade for one share, right? And this is now what's going to help us a little bit with our uh, footprint checking. FINRA will report all trades and shares traded executed by the broker on the off exchange on its weekly basis. So this is weekly FINRA data on its OTC transparency initiative. So the transparency initiative was FINRA's attempt to figure out how much was actually trading off exchange in the US. So here's an example of what the FINRA uh, OTC data looks like. Remember, this is weekly data. So this is the week of June 13th, all right? And um, 
So this is for Berkshire A. This is our 400 and whatever thousand dollar stock, all right? If you trade enough, then you get reported individually. But if you don't trade enough, there's something called de minimis trading and you just get lumped with everybody else. So we're gonna talk later, if I have time, about the impact of the de minimis rules. But notice that if you trade enough, and by trade enough, it means you have to trade like more than 200 shares a day. And we, you have to have more than 200 trades a day in a stock for you to, to kind of, and we go through the rules more for you to be named. But notice Drive Wealth and Robinhood, right? The total amount of shares traded this week in Berkshire A uh, off exchange was 11,001. All right, these guys traded almost all of them, right? But notice that they traded 5,299 shares in 5,299 trades. So it's almost certain that every one of these is a fraction, right? And similarly here with Robinhood uh, and Drive Wealth, right? Their number of shares and number of trades are exactly the same. The de minimis firms is everybody else who's trading anything off exchange. Again, most of the trading in Berkshire A is one share, but not all. You can see here, 332 trades and 458. So are all of the fractional, are these all fractional shares? Well, we need to keep thinking about that, right? So you can see that that's gonna be a first place where we're getting a hint. How can we be confident that the fractional shares here, are, that, that these one share trades are actually fractional shares? Well, a couple of things. Right? For one thing, if you send in an order to Robinhood for 1.2 shares, they send the one share to Citadel and they keep the 0.2, right? And we, at least that's been the case because we've been sending orders into Robinhood exactly to try and track these things down. But one of the things you notice, right, is that the, you know, this is Virtu and, and Citadel. They were reporting trades from the time this thing starts. But the, you know, these are the firms that are the, you know, so here's Schwab, this is Drivewell. This is here, we've got uh, Robinhood and uh, here's Drivewell. This is when they start reporting, right? And this is because they only found out they had to. Um, and you can kind of see, if you look at the average trade sizes, that Virtu and Citadel are very different. But these guys are all approximately one, right? So basically everything they're executing here is approximately average trade size is one. So that's more evidence that what we're seeing when we look at these ones um, are the same. And then we keep pushing, and I'm going to try and convince you in a minute. I know I'm going to open for questions in about five minutes, but so using this approach, what we're going to do then is the following. We know that each fractional share will appear on the tape as a non-exchange trade for one share. FINRA will report all the trades on a weekly basis, and it may be possible to identify these fractional share trades for particular brokers based on the trade reporting latency. Now, Bobby and Justin have a very nice paper where they tried to understand reporting latency. So what did we do? What we did is we executed a series of fractional trades using Robinhood and Cash App, which is powered by Drivewell. And so we, we sent in all these trades, fractional. I mean, we're buying Berkshire. We're buying all these high price stocks with tiny little trades. And... Um, and then we searched, we had our confirmations and we searched for the trades in the tag trade files to figure out the reporting latencies. Okay, so here's a, you know, a typical day when we were trading in Berkshire A, right? So I wanna point out a couple of things here. Here's the timestamps. Um, venue D is off exchange, right? Here's Berkshire A, these are all one share. Here's the price, okay? Here's the trade reporting facility. So this is New York and this is NASDAQ. There's another trade reporting facility in Chicago, but nobody uses it. Here's the participant timestamp. So we've got the SIP timestamp, but when it was actually the participant timestamp, that gives us the latency, all right? 
so now what? Guess what? These are our trades, right? So um, this, the, 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 the blue ones are Robin Hood and the gold ones are Drive Wolf. So what you notice, right, is that there's a certain, if you will, distinctive footprint to the latency for Drive Wolf and the latency for Robin Hood. Um, so, uh, and then look at this, this is an exchange trade, right? So, you know, latencies here are very different, um, but these guys, you know, they take a little while. So what we did, since, since we, we did this across a whole bunch of stocks, not just Berkshire, right? And we figured out what we think are the latencies for Drivewell and uh, Robin Hood trades. And um, so what also helps is that uh, Robinhood reports to the NASDAQ TRF and Drive Wealth reports to the NYSE TRF. And we sort of go through a variety of tests in the data, but you know, basically this is what you're seeing. And um, you know, this is after uh, you know, uh, they start to uh, report um, their, their trades. So, what we're seeing here is, you know, you're not going to see everything perfectly, but notice, you know, we can have a bound that will capture these. And we're going to use that to figure out what we think are the fractional trades executed by Robin Hood and Drivewell on the tape. And then what we're going to do using the predictions. So we go to the tape, we figure out on the tape which ones we think are fractional. Then we go back. And we try and estimate, given what we figured out, what there should be in terms of fractional trades on the OTC transparency data. And this is what we get. And in the paper, we provide a few more uh, tests of all this to sort of say, hey, we think we have figured out a way to do it. So let me stop for a minute. And so we have some chat here. I don't know if there are questions in the chat. Uh, Let's see. Who yeah, wants... there are a few questions in the chat. I, I can, if you can see them, you can just. Uh... Okay, so uh, Robert asked, "Are all brokers executing these at the midpoint?" This is really great. Robinhood executes at the midpoint. Drive Wealth executes at the quotes. So when we found all our Drive Wealth trains, they're all at the quotes. Uh, so you know, you were buying at the bid or the offer. Robinhood, every one we found, they were trading at the midpoint. So we were, we were kind of impressed about that. Um, and, um, you know, obviously something that was kind of fun to uh, contemplate. Um, no, okay, uh, Jim, uh, you, one share cannot set the NBBO uh, from my understanding. Uh, that's a good question though, Jim. Uh, yeah, no, yeah maybe, for, maybe for Berkshire it does because that is a round lot. Yeah, it's around. Didn't think about that. That's really cute. Um, it, yeah, it can't for anybody else, but it could for Berkshire A. Uh, we, let me check that. Wouldn't that be fun? What percentage of the time is the Berkshire A round lot uh, uh, NBBO actually a fraction? I love it. Thank you, Jim. Great question. Uh, can it set? Let me write this down. How you doing, Jim? Uh Okay. Paul has a question with a hand raised, so yeah, put it in voice. Bit, I was being a little bit facetious in the chat uh, by referring to an old hockey movie, but because I'm confused about the ultimate disposition of ownership in this fractional share market. Yeah. In my, my mind, Fidelity, say, would buy one share. And if people came to them for half shares, they would just say, sure, you own it. I'll take your money. And they would be the depository. And when they needed to buy another share for demand, they just go to the market and buy one more share. But here we have fractional shares going to the market. So is this just moved past our understanding of the ownership of single share certificate and votes? So Paul, there's I think there's a lot of interesting questions here and we've been playing with some of them. Let me come back to, um, so uh, Fidelity, 
does exactly the same thing that Robin Hood does. They have this thing called, I don't know, maybe Jim knows the name better than I, but like National Financial Services is kind of where they have, um, you know, where they ship a lot of their orders. Um, but uh, I bought stock. I own tiny little points of, of stock that I bought in my Fidelity account. Now, you cannot trade Berkshire A, a fractional on Fidelity. They will not take it. Um, but there's lots of other high price stocks that you can do fractional shares on. And in your Fidelity account, it shows that you, you, know, you own 0.05 you know, of a share of NVR or some of the other high price stocks. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, ownership and particularly governance. Who votes these things? And interestingly, Bobby, who seems to have a big position at Robin Hood and all these fractional things, keeps getting uh, proxy statements sent to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so presumably he, and, and my guess is, but I don't know, and we've been trying to pin this down, does, um, like, does Robin Hood you know, kind of collect like little votes and then aggregate them and, um, you know, vote the whole thing. I I'm not sure. Um, we have tried to pin this down and it's about as murky as pinning down the footprints. But I think it's a really interesting question, particularly when I show you how many trades of fractional shares in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Because otherwise we'll just- We have move on. many questions in the chat. I, I don't know if you would like to take your pick of them or <laughs> address uh, all Richie, of them. When, when brokers aggregate to FINRA, they're supposed to report the individual trades. That's our understanding. And then FINRA aggregates. Uh, and let's see. Yes, Jim Angel points out correctly. You know, one of the reasons I think that this thing all got started and, and took off so quickly uh, was a company called Motif that many of you may know. They were the first ones to come up with an individual direct indexing. And so, you know, you could give Motif $2,000 and, and buy, you know, electric car companies and you would end up with point, you know, 0.2 and 0.8 and 0.6 of a bunch of things. And then Motif was sold um, basically to Schwab and it is Schwab's system. Um, so, um, let me let me move on and I'll come back and do more uh, questions in a little while. But um, what I hope I've done is convinced you that we found the little Yeti footprints. And now what we're gonna do is figure out how many Yetis there are. So why do trade, why do investors trade fractional shares? Is it a different type of retail order flow? Um, if so, does it present information content? and? From a regulatory perspective, you know, how do you even begin to think about these things? So um, what are we going to do? We're going to take uh, tech data for all U.S. common stocks, the usual suspects. We're going to look March 1, 2021 through March 31, 2022, um, because basically uh, we're going to be really focusing on Robin Hood and Drive Wealth. And um, Robinhood really doesn't to us seem like they got going on this until the end of January and actually um, of 2021. And, and DriveWolf won't actually start until October of 2021, but that's what we're going to be focusing on. And then, you know, we're going to look at a bunch of stuff and we use the data from lots of places. And we're going to use the retail trading metric of Bomer Jones, Zhang Jin, the BGZZ. And um, I think we have some interesting comments that we can make there. So I think a lot of people, ourselves included, when we first started working on this, thought that this was just a way just to buy really high price stocks. And, you know, that's what we started doing. We started buying little tiny bits of Berkshire A. But actually, it's not. And uh, so these are the log percent of all fractional, you know, trades. Remember, we're looking at we're using these footprints to find all the Robin Hood drive well fractional share trades. And as you can see, um, you know, um, they're actually not just all high price stocks. This is uh, Berkshire A, but actually the average stock price of our fractional shares is only around $10. 
And part of that is because uh, a lot of fractional share trading is in IPOs and a lot of fractional share trading is in SPACs. Uh, so in general, the answer is no. Uh, it's really kind of spread across the universe, which we think is really interesting. And we think it's because of the way that you can now enter orders. Um, this is usually the table people find the most interesting. Um, you know, so, okay, if it's not just high priced, what are they buying, right? So this is kind of a fun table because this gives you um, our top 50 in terms of estimated total of fractional share trades. So these are ranked by these guys, all right? So our number one is Tesla. And of course they do have, at the time we were doing this, an average trade price of $810. Um, but notice the next one was AMC, which is one of your infamous meme stocks. And then, you know, here's another high price stock, here's GameStop. As you go through here, what you see are lots of the sort of stocks that are um, your basic um, consumer stocks, your Disney's, your Ford's, you know, um, as you look through here, a lot of meme stocks. And then you actually see some SPACs. I think this was the Donald Trump SPAC. Uh, it's kind of fun to show in here. Um, but again, um, these are the 50 most actively traded uh, of, of fractional shares. So as you go over here, this is the percentage of all trades that are fractional in our 13 month sample period that we've estimated. And again, you can see these are non-trivial across you know, these top 50, it's about 4% of all trades, but notice it's like 6.7% of all Tesla shares, 10% of Amazon. Um, so non-trivial, you know, 7% of Coinbase. Um, so again, as you look across here, kind of interesting that we estimate a whole bunch of these. Now, a couple of other things, you know, one of the things that we as microstructure research have noted for a long time is that there are lots of single share trades out there, right? And I always thought that most of the single share trades came about because firms were basically looking about for liquidity, right? So you're trying to find whether there's hidden liquidity out there that's in between the quotes so you send in, you know, a market order for one share, see at the midpoint, see if there's anything in there. Sure enough, there is, you execute, right? So that was what I thought was the main reason, was the only reason actually for single share trades. But um, actually, you know, now we know that's not actually true. So this column shows percentage of all single share trades that are fractional. And um, as you can see, um, this is a whole lot of them. So we certainly don't want to say that, you know, all single share trades are fractional because we know of the hidden liquidity reason. But, you know, this number surprised me because what it means is, oh, there's more going on out there than just looking around for liquidity. And if you look at, um, these are all, single share trades on FINRA in the FINRA trade data that we're looking at that are fractional. Now what you see is how important these retail fractional orders are, right? Because, you know, percentage of all single share trades that are fractional includes, um, you know, the exchange, right? Um, but this is just what we're seeing in the off exchange venues. So um, we think this is a pretty intriguing table because it really says to us at least that retail trading is changing in a very interesting way. Now um, let's keep talking about why did they do this? Well let's run some data, you know, run some regression. So here we're looking at all of our Robinhood drive wealth fractional shares, right? And we're going to look at them. I think we're doing this on daily. I think we aggregate here. I have to go back and check, but I think so. Um, I could be wrong, but I think so. Uh, and so we're going to run here a regression that regresses this on essentially retail flow, price, market cap, whether this is an IPO, the age of the stock, volatility, turnover, a whole bunch of stuff. 
Uh, where are we getting our uh, retail order flow measure? This is the BJZZ metric. And I know most of you know what that is, but they came up with a metric that said, hey, you know, exchanges, you know, will give you price improvement, but they will only do it in pennies. But if you do off exchange, you can get these, you know, tiny little things like my 2.994. And so the VJZZ metric uses these sort of odd little execution prices to say, ah, that looks like a retail trade. Part of the challenge, though, is they um, exclude midpoint trades when they in this. And uh, as as we found, all of our Robinhood fractional share trades are at midpoints. So that's an interesting challenge for their metric. Um, so um, if fractional share execution was randomly distributed across retail trades, then the only meaningful association should be with retail order flow, right? If these are just more or less retail and they don't have anything else, you wouldn't expect to see much. But that's not what we find, right? We certainly find they're correlated with uh, the retail flow, which we expect. But as you can see, price, the age, volatility, these all are important uh, explanatory variables for explaining um, you know, the volume of uh, fractional share trading that we're seeing. And, and so I think, I think what we interpret this data as saying is these are different kinds of beasts. They are retail, but they're not like the usual retail. Um, so does that mean that it's a distinct form of order flow? And might it contain value relevant information? Well, how are we going to figure that out? Well, I think to begin with, we we generally would think that um, from the literature that app based traders are different because a lot of these orders, you know, virtually all the orders at Robinhood or DriveWealth are coming in through their app, right? So. We know from paper by Evo that Robinhood investors traded aggressively during the pandemic. You know, Brad Barber and his co-authors found they didn't do a very good job. Um, these guys found, you know, Robinhood trading associated with lower liquidity, the Eaton Green Rosewood Wu paper. And then there's another paper by Joan, Zhang, and Zhang. Um, they found using their metric that retail trading is associated with higher next day spreads and volatility. Um, one of the things I would note is these three papers are, you know, identified Robinhood trading using robintrack.net data. And I know a number of you are familiar with that. Sadly, uh, Robinhood discontinued that data in August, 2020. So our ability to kind of use that to figure out what was going over there was not good. Uh, but the good news is now we do know more about the Robinhood footprint and um, at least for their off exchange trading. Uh, so it's a thought. So what are we going to run? Well, using this BJZZ metric, but again, I think it's a challenge now because there actually are institutional single dealer platforms that will give institutions um, price improvement in non you know decimal ports. And it, it's it's a bit of a challenge. So, um, you know, we have to think about that. So what are we going to do? We're going to use the Jones, Zhang, and Zhang framework. We're going to run a series of horse race regressions to see how our measure of fractional share trading stacks up to their measure in predicting next day spreads and volatility, right? So we're going to be predicting either spreads or volatility. And um, here is their measure. Here's ours. And then we get a lot of the sorts of things that um, you'd expect to find influencing spreads of volatility from all of our microstructure research, right? So here we're looking at the lie, the total number of our trades and the total uh, volume. Yeah, I mean, we have to use numbers, right? Because we don't know the dollar volume of our actual trades because they're all reported as one, right? Um, and then we also know from our table, which I didn't present because I thought I'd run out of time, that um, if you take the top stocks that are estimated in terms of retail trade using the BJZZ metric, 
um, they are concentrated, right? I mean, it's it's their metric picks things up in like the you know the top hundred or so. Uh, they go down to a thousand, and so do we. But they are concentrated. Uh, ours are concentrated too, and even a bit more than theirs. So we're gonna we're gonna let that influence things. So here's some results, right? So here we're looking at spreads, and this kind of interesting. Um, when we use their metric, um, they don't actually predict next day effective spreads, and our metric does. Uh, and you can see that the you know the influence of concentration does matter, right? So retail volume times top hundred does matter for them uh, and for us. Um, Here's intraday volatility, both of them pick it up. Um, but again, our coefficient is double theirs. Uh, and um, again, concentration seems to matter. So the intraday volatility, uh, this is coming from the words metric. And then this is implied volatility. So we wandered over to the options market and uh, you know we kind of grabbed stuff there. And again, um, the fractional share trades uh, are predictive. Uh, so I think these are kind of interesting results because it tells us there's a richness to retail trade that we didn't appreciate it. And I, I'm intrigued by all this. I mean, it's a new way to trade. And, um, you know, we're going to have to see what difference it makes. So um, let's talk a little bit about the problems of using these things. I know I went out of time before very long, so I'm supposed to leave time at the end for discussion. but. Um, so we know that our fractional shares are not actually sh trades of one, but that's where they're reported. So how big a problem is this? Now, let's be clear, unless someone's going to give us the data on their actual fractional shares, we're not going to know that. So here's what we're going to do. We admit, pretty crude, but here's what we're doing. The CEO of Robinhood last year in testifying before Congress said that the medium total account value of a um, Robinhood customer was $240, okay? So we're gonna make the, I admit, Herculean assumption that the true value of the trade is either the lower of $240 or and 10% of reported value. So, um, so you know, if we're trading Berkshire, okay, 10% of one share of Berkshire would be, you know, uh, $470,000. So clearly $240 would be less than that. So we're going to assume that share, that trade was $240. Or the lower of $240 and 90% of reported trade value. We admit this is very crude, but it does give us a way to begin to think about this. We have a different paper where we looked at Berkshire A, and we estimated that 80% of the volume um, in Berkshire A was, was overestimated. I mean, it's just crazy how much it adds to them. But here's essentially what the percent distribution of the overestimate is. These is in logs, right? So, you know, the log of something coming on here. I have a note in my thing. Um, the natural log of 1% is about minus 4.6, right? So, you know, in here, you're talking that the amount of volume overestimate for the average stock, you know, on average is not too big, all right? But if you look in the tail, you do find some really interesting results. And... This is examining the tail distribution. We kicked out Berkshire A because they just screw everything up. Um, so if you look in the tail, which says, you know, going back to here, we're, we're going to look out here, right? We're going to look starting basically around here, okay? We're going to ask, well, you know, take all of our percent inflation ranges that we have and we'll break it down into size quintiles, right? Because if you have a really low price stock, the volume inflation turns out to be fairly low. And if you have a really high price stock, the volume inflation obviously is gonna be much higher, right? What we find is that for 6,500 plus stock days, inflation is greater than 1%. Uh, 
For a thousand stock days, inflation is greater than 25%. For 482 stock days, inflation is greater than 50%. And for 313 stock days, inflation is greater than 75%. Now, why do we care? Well, as researchers, we don't really like it when people screw up our volume numbers. But there's lots of actual legal reasons that you want to know about this, because the things like being able to do stock buybacks and, uh, you know, sort of cutoffs for um, uh, class action suits and things like that, they all work off of average daily volumes. So when you have, you know, stocks that, you know, you can have days when the volume is 75% above the real value because of the stupid rule that you report one, it's non-trivial. Now, um, I, we've also, I, I want to real briefly talk about one other thing before we quit. Um, so if you're going to use this data, you have to be really careful. The volume issue is non-trivial. Here's another one. Remember that de minimis table I showed you? So the de minimis says, um, if you don't trade enough in this stock on any given day, then we don't report you by name and we lump you with everybody, right? Um, and here's what's part of the problem. Even to get into that, you have to do a certain amount of shares every day or you don't even get there. So uh, overall, like we took, as an example, we took Clorox, a uh, 57 week sample. The OTC data for Robinhood trade is missing in 33 weeks, even though our metric shows that Robinhood has many trades. Um, so, uh, and the OTC reported trades over, over this 57 week um, sample for Clorox was 32,091, but our classifier found 62,766. So they didn't even get into de minimis, right? So if you thought that, hey, I'll just use the FINRA data, think again, it, there's too much that's not there. And when we did it for all the stocks, and we talk about this in the paper, for 65% of, of stocks, OTC data shows no Robinhood drive wall share trades on a given day when we show at least 200 trades. And 70% of stocks, OTC data, uh, showed trades only for less than half the weeks. So be very careful when you're using this. I think you can do really good stuff with this, but I don't think you can use the FINRA data. I think you have to do kind of what we did. So what did we do? We come up with a new way uh, to try and find these fractional shares on an intraday basis. We showed you that they're not limited to the most expensive stocks. They go across lots of retail stocks. Um, we think this is because of the new way things work. Um, fractional share trades do seem to serve as a proxy for Robinhood retail trade investors. So that's kind of fun if you want to think about a way to do research that way. Um, consistent with these traders, uh, these trades reflect a unique type of order firm. We found they actually have unique information. For a regulatory system, the system is suboptimal. They're visible, but they risk creating severe distortions. A quick fix would be to add a flag to a trade report indicating a fractional share execution. I mean, they could do that tomorrow. Um, and, you know, we do have to deal with, I think the SEC has to deal with everybody should be reporting trades the same way, not sort of have things that don't even show up. Um, again, if you want to think about things, trading is no longer tethered to share amounts. Retail trading may become more significant. Could you use this to do some interesting behavioral work? And finally, caveats for researchers. Um, be careful not to use the data to sign trade. Robinhood declares fractional trades at midpoints. This won't show up in widely used measures of retail trading. So let me end here because I think I'm supposed to. And uh, let me open it up for questions or comments or just general discussion. Um, so. Thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, there are plenty of questions in the chat, but it probably in the interest of time by now makes more sense if, uh, if the questions are not addressed that people just raise hands and voice their questions because it's uh, questions and comments. Uh, and I see Joel has his hand up. I do, so, I see Joel's uh, hand there. Hey, Joel. <laughs> Maybe that's where we start. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? I can. 
Okay, I, you know, one of the most striking, this is just a, a menu of uh, facts here that could have us, you know, working away for the next couple of years. One of the most intriguing things was why does Robin Hood uh, do those trades at the midpoints? Yeah. And it's clear that it's not uniform industry practice because the others don't. And I, I know this is going to be sort of a, a weird dog that doesn't bark uh, explanation, but it may be that the directions of these fractional trades collectively are, are really informative, um, but they're only useful in trading if they're private information. So in a way, reporting all the trades at, at midpoints, executing the trades at midpoints sort of represents the cost to Robinhood of keeping the information private. And since the size of these trades may be very, very small, mm -hmm. that cost might be very low. That's just a possibility. It's because very interesting. Robin Hood does not give things away. No, I think it's a great comment. I will tell you that uh, fractional shares are are heavily biased, heavily. Um, but your point is a very good one because if on some days there's a bunch of cells, that may actually be quite informative. And we... Um, you know, we, we've been very leery about the signing of these things. They, they look like if you look at drive wealth, um, which does put them at the bids and the offers, uh, that's where you see the imbalance is, is largely with respect to buys. But, you know, what we could do and it's a really good suggestion is we could take the drive wealth trades, which we can sign because they're at the quotes and see if they have a particular information content. Um, we didn't do that. Uh, and that would be, cons if, if there was something there uh, that was differential, that would be very interesting. Um, so thanks, Joel, great suggestion. Um, Thomas Ernst. Thanks. So maybe first follow up from Joel's question, why wouldn't a wholesaler want to do these fractional trades if there is some informational advantage? Because I assume you know, Robinhood can't really take advantage of it in a way that a wholesaler could. But then the other question I was going to ask is, you showed us that Drive Wealth and Robinhood look really different in their latency. Yeah. When you look at that latency spike, let's say where Robinhood is, how do you know that there aren't other firms in the market, uh, whether they're other fractional share firms or ATSs that would show up in that latency band? That's a great question. Um, and here's the good news, all right? With respect to Robinhood, they're like the slowest firm in the world, as far as we can tell. Because uh, Bobby and Justin have this other paper where they were busy estimating all these latencies. And like, if you remember when I showed you that table, the latency of the trade that was on the exchange was like 28. And the latency of like Robinhood is like, you know, 2,800, right? So uh, one of the things we know is that Robinhood is really, really slow. Uh, now, drive wealth is not as slow. So there is the possibility that some of what we're picking up and calling drive wealth is someone else. But, and this is again, where I think it's kind of fun. Remember the picture I showed you where we tried to use our metric to then estimate the number of trades FINRA would show as say drive wealth or Robin Hood and they, they're like perfect. Um, and, so I, you know, let's be clear, you know, we're, we're looking for footprints and, um, you know, I think the drive wealth guys, interestingly enough, we actually do a better job of predicting their trades than we do on the Robin Hood. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. And these latencies turn out to be quite distinctive, right? They're like the, the Yeti has an extra toe sort of thing. Uh, let's see here, but that's a great question. Could I, if no one else has their hand up, could I jump in and ask one other question quick, which is sure. what fraction of these fractional shares are people trading like 0.99 and below versus people trading like 1.5 or 2.5. And this is like the fractional from a bigger order. That's a tough question. Um, we, we can't exert the actual fraction, right? 
So I don't know if it's 0.99 or 0.09 or 0.49, right? Mm -hmm. We did do uh, some uh, trading where we bought mm -hmm. like 1.2, 1.8, you know, just to kind of understand if in fact um, they really did move the other part along. And interestingly enough, they did. I mean, you know, when we were sending in trades for 1.8 to Robinhood, we, you know, we got the 0.8, we find that, and then we can find the one uh, later uh, because we, we basically have two confirmations. So um, I don't know 0.99. Uh, I do think that a lot of this now is that someone says, well, I want to buy, you know, $500. And that turns out to be 10.67 shares. And so there's 10 somewhere that's going to execute. And, and this 0.67 is going to show up as one. Um, so um, that's kind of what we're seeing as we look at, at the data. OK. Uh, any other comments or questions? Let's see. Oh, hi, Maureen. Hi. Who am I talking question. to? Jim. Hi, Jim. Yes. Um, do you have any idea how these firms are doing the market making? In particular, uh, do they short fractions of shares as well as go long, or do they always have at least zero? And if they do go short, how do they deal with reg show? We don't know. I mean, you know, that becomes, um, you know, the, again, uh, they're not actually forthcoming with respect to exactly what they do. Um, and so we don't know. Um, you know. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Fred, I see you have your hand up. Yes. Yeah, so I'm having a question about the whether uh, the market or market makers see the actual volume or do they just see an inflated volume? And they, if they see the inflated volume, do they overreact to when retail buy comes in? So we have this other paper on... Uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and it's just remarkable. I mean, nobody figured out what was going on. You know, Berkshire's volume is like 80% of what it was. Even Berkshire Hathaway didn't know what was going on. And uh, so basically, nobody really appreciated that this was happening. And uh, I think now they're beginning to appreciate it. But, um, you know, as far as we know, we're really the only paper on this. And uh, so, you know, it'd be interesting to see if, what impact it has down the road. But for now, you know, I think they're beginning to figure out that these one share trades are, are little critters that are very different. Peter? Oh, um, uh, there was a, a statement that maybe a uh, younger generation prefers a uh, uh, round number of dollars uh, rather than uh, a round number of shares, especially if they trade from the phones and uh, other handheld devices, but it was never elaborated. Uh, whether was it uh, some reason for proliferation of the uh, fractional trades? Well, I think it's um, you know if you remember, we're looking at drive wealth and Robinhood. Uh, trades, right? And these are, for the most part, younger clientels, right? Um, you know, my two co-authors both have Robinhood accounts. I have a Fidelity account. Uh, you know, maybe I I should switch, but, um, you know, and now when I trade at Fidelity, I also turn in, you know, dollar amounts because you can do that at Fidelity. So I think that this started with the younger generations trading on places using their phones. I don't know about you, Peter, but I don't trade on my phone. Um, and, uh, but, you know, maybe we're trainable and, uh, you know, maybe we'll all start trading on our phones. And if that's the case, then I think there'll be, you know, a very different evolution of this market. But for now, I don't think it is. Um, so Joel, your hand is up, but it may just not have gone down. Is that the case? Uh, no, actually, actually I, I had a, a follow-up um, question ob observation. And I, I hate to see, seem like I'm dumping on Robinhood because they've been innovative in so many ways and in increasing the participation in our capital markets. And yet, besides the midpoint thing, 
their latency is also, as you point <laughs> out, distinctively large. And, you know, what is the easiest way for me to predict the future? Well, it's delaying everybody else's knowledge of the present. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is consistent with uh, perhaps the use of their order flow as private information for trading rules. Consistent Maybe. with. Maybe. I mean, you know, Joel, you're kind of a half empty kind of guy here. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I don't know. They they really are. I mean, their latency is just so, so, so much slower, but it may just be that they don't have the right technology. Um, I oh, don't but know. they're so good in technology in so many other respects. Yeah, maybe. Um, their customer service left a lot to be desired. Uh, so, um, you know, it could be, and I, I like your suggestion of thinking about the difference between the drive off and the and the um, uh, Robin Hood. That that's a cute way to think about it. You might be right. Um, well, um, I think I'm almost out of time, and Katia will yell at me. But if there's one last question, it doesn't seem to be. No, I won't yell at all. <laughs> this is very interesting. <laughs> there was one question in the chat from uh, Julia Reynolds about uh, short and fractional shares, whether it could also lead to uh, inflated estimates of short interest. But I guess you said it's mostly buys. Uh, yeah, so. as far as we can tell, like you cannot short a fractional share on Robinhood. Um, I do not believe you can short any of them. Um, you know, it's, you know, we, we use like six, seven different brokerage houses to turn in fractional shares. Um, and, you know, like I say, they all have different rules, like Robinhood and, and um, um, is among the most, I mean, you can trade anything on Robinhood, Berkshire, et cetera. Most of them have a, um, you, you can't trade the really, really high price stocks, really, really like the Berkshires and those guys. Um, so, and I do not believe you can short on any of them fractionally, um, but you know, who knows that may be down the road. Um, uh, well, uh, let's see, am I out of time? I guess I have one minute. I Yandin, have, did you yeah, want to ask I have something? a question about like the latency, could that be because by Robin who tried to internalize the fraction shares, like the, the, the way they report, like they go every fraction share, go to the reporting, but do they internalize like matching the sales and buys internally? So the latency may be explained by, they try to find the counter partners and then the latency comes in. Well, again, I, I don't think there's enough trading to account for that. Do okay. you know what I mean? Like, even with their latency, we're still talking, you know, in, in fractions of seconds, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, on some stocks, you know, like with Berkshire, you know, there's like 5,000 trades in a week, right? That, so the odds that you would be matching it in any middle of a second is kind of slow. But I like the intuition. I, I, I don't think that's it. Okay. But well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate the comments. Thanks again for inviting me. And uh, hopefully, um, now that you know about fractional share trading, you can you can go wild. Uh, so thanks again. Thank you, Marie. Well, thank you very much, Marie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we hope to see you again in uh, two weeks uh, when uh, Marius Zerkan will talk to us about uh, market fragmentation and uh, decentralized finance. Thank you again.